A chain of events quickly unfolded in the fall of 1920 that led to what has been described as one of the greatest medical advances of the 20th century. Fred Banting, an unknown former frontline surgeon struggling to make ends meet, stumbled across an article. This tiny event triggered a monumental discovery. He reads an article by Moses Barron, and on the night of October 31st, 1920, Banning jots down in his notebook a little idea for research on diabetes. Ligate pancreatic ducts of dog. Keep dogs alive till Asini degenerate, leaving eyelids. It seemed like such a crazy idea that even Banting doubted its potential success. He wanted to remove the pancreas from hundreds of laboratory dogs to isolate the cells that produce insulin. From these extracts, he would then produce pure insulin to regulate the blood sugar of human patients. To make his idea work, he returned to his alma mater, the University of Toronto, where he met with world-renowned physiologist J.J.R. McLeod. From their very first meeting, Banning and McLeod were not particularly copacetic. Uh, McLeod was a senior professor, articulate, very learned. Banning was a young guy who knew almost nothing about what he was trying to talk about. But Banting was a dreamer with just enough salesmanship to win over the academic. McLeod was favorable enough that he said, well, if you want to come back at the end of the year, I might be able to give you some help. He said to his two graduate students, well, you guys help Banning out. He needs all the help he can get. Uh, and the two graduate students tossed a coin to see who would work first with Banting. Charles Best won the coin toss, and nobody knows the name of the guy who lost. <laughs> Best was a 21-year-old science graduate. He was not in medicine. He was a bright guy and ambitious and looked forward to working with Banting on this st strange idea. The conditions were inadequate, a single lab and only a handful of dogs to work with. Still, in the middle of 1921, Banting and Best went to work on their laboratory dogs. Banting thought that by surgically cutting off the digestive function of the pancreas, it would cease to produce digestive enzymes. It might produce pure insulin. The work was promising, but there was a problem. They were quickly running out of dogs, and if they ran out of dogs, the research stopped. Fred Banning was a stubborn, determined person who had risked everything on one idea. He had given up his practice, and he was out of money. In a way, he just gambled everything. Banting and Best were so desperate for more animals that they resorted to catching stray dogs on the street. This makeshift solution kept the research going long enough for Banting to conceive of a better plan. Banting made a big breakthrough when he discovered that his original idea was wrong in the sense that he could dispense with all of this stuff about ligating ducts and letting the pancreas atrophy. He just went to the slaughterhouse and he got fresh uh, beef or pork pancreas and it turned out that it worked just as well. The trouble was that, that it was maddeningly inconsistent. You'd give an extract and the blood sugar would go down and then you'd give another extract and nothing would happen. Despite their differences, Banting wrote McLeod. The number of problems that are presenting themselves is becoming greater and greater. Some of them I would wish to present for your approval. One, the securing of the most active and concentrated form of the substance, which Best and I called Islatin. By Christmas of 1921, their results were so inconsistent that Banning thought they had to have help, so did McLeod. The challenge was getting the alcohol level in the extract just right, so that it was both pure enough and non-toxic for human consumption. They brought a fourth member of the research team on board, a man named James B. Collip, who had a PhD in biochemistry and had a lot of expertise at working with extracts of tissue. Collip, though intrigued by Banting's work, was hired by McLeod, who set him up in a separate laboratory, and instructed him not to share his results with Banting or Best. So the race was to see which lab would be the first to refine the extract enough for use in human trials. The patient chosen to first get the pancreatic extract was a 14-year-old boy named Leonard Thompson. He was reduced to 65 pounds from his diabetes and was within a few weeks of death. On January the 11th, 1922, the clinicians in Toronto General Hospital injected Leonard Thompson 
with uh, pancreatic extract made by Banting and Best. Great milestone in history. Well, no, because that first test failed. Twelve days later, on January 23rd, 1922, they resumed administration of extract on Leonard Thompson, and this time they got spectacular success. Leonard Thompson flourished with collops extract. The chemist had determined exactly the right amount of alcohol to purify Banting's elixir. The key breakthrough was collops' ability to purify Banting and Bess crude extract. The early patients were a lucky few, and after surviving three years on a starvation diet that nearly killed her, Elizabeth Hughes was one of them. Fred Banning examined 15-year-old Elizabeth Hughes on August 16, 1922. She was 5 feet tall, she weighed 45 pounds, and was clearly within a day or two of death from starvation. He began giving her insulin, and we have an amazing record with wonderful letters of Elizabeth coming back to life. In 1923, Fred Banting and J.J.R. McLeod were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. While only two names appeared on the award, one presenter at the ceremony stated that in the discovery of insulin, there is glory enough for all. As a result of this collaboration of four people who didn't like each other and who occasionally literally fought each other, nonetheless, within 18 months, this team gave the world an effective treatment for diabetes. News soon spread about the remarkable results that Elizabeth Hughes and others had achieved. But the remaining masses still suffering from diabetes would wait until someone learned to mass produce the miracle drug. They waited, with their lives hanging in the balance. The corporate story of Nova Nordisk is closely intertwined with the discovery of insulin and dates back over 85 years. It is rooted in the philosophy that the patient should be the center of care. And the patient in our story is Dr. Marie Crow, a physician with type 2 diabetes herself who was the beloved wife of Dr. Auguste Crow, a Nobel Prize winning physiologist from Denmark. During a lecture tour in the United States, Dr. Crow heard about the discovery of insulin in Canada and raced to Toronto to obtain a license to manufacture insulin in Denmark. When he returned to Denmark, he enlisted the help of his wife's physician, Dr. H.C. Hagedorn, and Nordisk Insulin Laboratory was born. Since 1923, Novo Nordisk has worked to purify insulin and to design new insulins that more closely match the needs of the patient. This coupled with the development of devices that make insulin easier to use and educational materials that make the lives of patients with diabetes easier. Novo Nordisk's commitment and corporate vision is to defeat diabetes. In the meantime, we're working on a day-by-day -day basis to improve the lives of people with diabetes.